really help you all move forward. Um, so we're really excited. Um, you know, we're going to talk a little bit about um, what we've um, been doing over the last nine months and been really spend the bulk of what we've talked about um, in the recommendations in the report. And um, I think most folks have seen the report. Um, I think we published it in December, maybe a couple of weeks after that. So um, I'm assuming most folks have read it. And um, we are really excited about talking about it in a little bit of depth and hopefully um, getting some questions if folks have questions around it, any of our findings. So um, the presentation overview. So we're just gonna we're gonna spend about 15, 20 minutes talking um, about um, a summary of the report. Um, we're gonna I'm gonna give you some background and methodology. We're I'm gonna talk about how we assessed your current system and what we found, and then we're gonna really spend the bulk of this morning talking about the overall <coughs> recommendations, and then we're hoping to leave you with um, some um, things to think about steps going forward, um, how how to help um, start implementing some of these recommendations. Sorry. Um, yeah, that's okay. it was very it was very clear to us when we first started um, working in your community that everybody um, is involved. Everybody was engaged in really fixing this problem, and it was from you know your local county, your local city officials, so Lake County, the city of Eugene, um, the community as a whole, um, stakeholders that are, that uh, touch the system and the community as a whole, your local um, homelessness providers that serve folks who are experiencing homelessness, and consumers themselves. So it's, it, it's a, it, we don't see this in a lot of communities, but it was an all 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 hands in and roll up your sleeves effort. And that was very, very evident to us the first time we were here, even in April of 2018. So um, again, it's just a, a remarkable amount of investment that's been made by this community around these issues. So I just wanted to make sure we point that out. So as I said, we began working um, with the community in March of 2018. Our methodology was really around a lot of data collection and information collection. So we took in you know, hardcore data that you guys have been collecting for many, many years, as well as newer data on trends as, um, as, um, as the, your federal partners who um, fund a lot of your programs, mostly HUD, um, have um, um, increased their data collection and what you can um, look at. Then we had um, a lot of stakeholder interviews stakeholder interviews and meetings. Um, we were in constant contact with the county and the city of Eugene. We were, um, we met with, I think, over 30, 40 um, different entities, um, whether it was in person or on the phone. We had follow-up email conversations, follow-up phone calls. So we, we, we really appreciate the time that folks spent to give us a true picture of what your community looks like. That's just really important for us to be able to paint the picture of the system without living here and being part of it. Um, then we, through that, we analyzed and assessed your system. We created um, a system map, which I'm, sh I'm assuming most folks have seen. Um, it's on the county website. Um, it's been passed out a couple times, so it, sh it should be um, readily available. And then um, we developed recommendations for that picture that we painted through that analysis. So our recommendations, there's 10 recommendations that we're going to go over. And then, um, and then we really, um, it all kind of culminated into this final report that we're going to talk about today. OK. So the assessment of the system. So, um, so we focused around um, the high number of unsheltered folks in your community. 83% of single adults make up your homelessness population, and of the unsheltered homeless population in Lane County, 89% of those folks are single adults. Um, your last pit, your point in time count in 2018, so it was about a year ago now, you're getting ready to do your 2019 pit, of the unsheltered population, about 53 reported that they are chronically homeless, 38% reported they had serious mental illness, and 30% they had the, um, substance use disorder. Those I just want to point out are self-reports, so the numbers could be much higher. So that was what was recorded in your pit in 2018 around the um, street, the folks that were un unsheltered living in, on the street or places that are for human habitation. Um, looking at the system capacity issues, so you guys have done a lot of work around this in the, over the last decade, maybe plus, um, that's very evident. But um, I think that um, you were early adopters of things like the coordinated entry system and things over the years and the whole homeless system and homeless world have really emerged. So luckily, we've learned some more emerging practices and promising practices out there that we were able to incorporate into your report. So we looked at your system, saw what you've been doing and are doing, have been doing for a long time, and um, through the recommendations, have talked about ways to tweak that with 
other things that we, we found out over um, in, in the industry over the last um, decade or so. Um, you have some external challenges, right, that are completely out of your control. The, and we've talked a lot about this when we did our preliminary recommendations, and it's a bulk of the um, report, but you have an extremely tight rental market, um, higher, so the vacancy rate is lower, so it's harder to find vacant units. Your stock is a little bit lower. The, um, the um, per capita income is, is a little bit lower, so it makes for that. It's more expensive for folks who make lower income to afford rental units. So that in and of itself is a really tough challenge. And you have um, in your system a high number of folks who are newly homeless. So you're, you're, you have this, um, this, this, um, this, this info or it is this newly homeless number that um, is challenging as well, that is out of your control. So I'm going to pass it over to Doug and he's gonna start kick us off talking about the recommendations and then we'll go from there. Great, thank you, Gina. Uh, thank you, everybody, for being here. My name is Doug Tatro. Um, just to echo Gina's uh, comments, we really appreciate the commitment that everyone in this room and our partners in the city and county have made to this process. We couldn't have been uh, hopefully doing a good job for you all without uh, all the effort that came in, so we, we appreciate that. So as Gina mentioned, um, through this entire process, there have we've published or come up with uh, 10 recommendations, and I'll read them briefly for anybody who can't see the screen, and then we're going to go through each one with a little bit more specificity. Um, but our 10 recommendations, um, just to note, are meant to be a package deal. They're meant to work together. So any one of these can be an effective practice or an effective effort uh, uh, throughout the county in terms of trying to reduce the number of people experiencing homelessness, uh, but taken together, uh, is where we think that the most impact can happen. And so uh, we want you to, to be aware of that, that they're not necessarily numerically in order of priority, but these are meant to be a system, a, a, a reorientation of your system, uh, uh, crisis response system overall. So uh, quickly, the recommendations cover um, outreach, um, the expansion of diversion services, uh, uh, better and different coordination of your rapid rehousing resources, additional utilization and creation of permanent supportive housing, um, uh, something called move on strategies, which we'll talk about in a couple of minutes, uh, looking at the utilization of your tenancy supports, so case management and other supports for uh, folks that are going into housing, um, looking at how your coordinated entry system, which we, you were one of the early adopters, can have greater efficiencies and sort of come up to some of the lessons learned we've seen nationally, um, and then uh, looking at how you can um, coordinate your landlord and housing partners in a different way, and that's followed up with um, uh, more training for uh, all levels of staff, and in particular frontline staff, as well as uh, the origination of the support, and that is the addition of low barrier emergency shelter year-round beds. Um, so the first recommendation that we're going to talk about is uh, the expansion and better coordination of outreach. So you can see here that we've identified the need for at least an additional five outreach workers, and importantly, uh, a person or an entity that is coordinating those outreach services. So one thing that we've learned here, and we see it a lot of places across the country, is that there are different outreach teams who are looking for different types of folks, uh, but they don't always necessarily talk to each other, and they don't always necessarily have a pathway back to the housing system. So this, it's not just the addition of people who can be out in the city of Eugene, in Lane County, uh, 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 trying to engage with folks who may need services and housing, but making sure that they're being coordinated in a centralized way, in a coherent way, and that there's then a connection back to the services that those folks uh, need and desire. Um, that also includes uh, continuing to look at new uses of mobile technology. You see this with the pit count, but also things like doing intakes with tablets or having making sure that all outreach workers have a coordinated cell phone uh, protocol so they can communicate, or if an outreach team looking for somebody with a very specific um, uh, uh, situation, um, say a PATH team can communicate to a general outreach specialist if somebody else is engaged that doesn't meet the PATH team's eligibility. So it's, it's, it's more people, but it's also really looking at how you create an outreach system that connects back uh, to your housing system. Um, and then we also added in, and you'll see this in a couple of recommendations, a flexible fund that can help um, uh, support emergency financial needs for people who are outside or on the streets or living in their cars. And you'll see this in a couple of places, and we can, we can answer questions as to, as to why and how. But a, a flexible fund for your outreach teams to use to help make sure people are safe in the immediate crisis that they're facing, and then reconnect it back. Um, we'll go to the next recommendation. We're going quickly, so we can make sure we have time for, for questions. Um, expanding diversion and rapid exit strategies. I'll refer to these together as diversion. Um, we do recommend adding diversion specialists uh, both into your emergency shelter system or the front doors of where people present for crisis services, 
uh, it, as well as through your outreach team. So diversion is an emerging practice. It's one that if anyone tells you that they know exactly how to do it correctly, they're lying. Um, it's something <laughs> we're working on uh, in a number of places and, and uh, actually through the VA system we're working on a lot right now. Uh, but really when folks are coming in uh, to homelessness or about to be homeless, trying to look for alternative, even if temporary solutions to that, to that challenge they're facing. Maybe they do have family or friends that are willing to um, bring them in for a night or two or a week or two or a month so that you can begin working on a longer term housing plan. But the focus of these diversion services is really keeping people out of the emergency shelter system while still giving them access to your, your other types of supports. Um, so adding those folks in uh, and making sure that they're trained. So one thing we are learning about diversion practices uh, as they emerge is that training and the people who do it are really important. So uh, there are certain uh, techniques that happen when folks are coming in and say, I don't have a place to go today. Let's have a conversation not about how quickly we get you to shelter, but first let's see if there's an alternative. And if there is not, then we will do everything we can to bring you in and make you safe tonight. Um, and, and again, this is a practice that, that is emerging and we can, we can speak to more. Um, go to the next recommendation. So we've got outreach, so we're, we're actively looking to engage folks out there. Uh, we're, we're trying to coordinate that engagement process, so we actually have a linkage back to the services those people uh, want and need. Uh, then we also have diversion, where folks who are presenting uh, as homeless, maybe for the first time, are going back into the system. We're exploring alternatives to their homelessness that may not require a long-term housing support yet. Maybe it is social networks or family or community of origin. And then we have um, expanding and coordinating rapid rehousing. So rapid rehousing is an incredibly difficult uh, project type or program to run well. Um, and uh, being able to coordinate those services is really important. So the best rapid rehousing communities are those that have really uh, good rapid rehousing providers that are serving clients and people from the community at large. So that uh, they have that specialized skill of housing counseling, of the landlord engagement, of understanding what it means to sustain a tenancy. And they're really focused on uh, this idea of four-dimensional tenancy supports and really trying to make sure that there is equity in services, not necessarily equality. So equity is what people need to end their homelessness, no more, no less, uh, rather than everybody getting uh, the same thing, right? So uh, looking at your rapid rehousing portfolio, expanding that portfolio, looking for additional sources of funding, what we have found is that rapid rehousing, which is a short to medium term rental assistance uh, with case management, can work for many, many people. So many people who come into homelessness do not need the longest term uh, subsidies. Many do, but some many do not. And we can solve their homelessness with three, six, 12 months of assistance, and they're back on their feet and, and moving on with their lives. Um, so looking at that, that rapid free housing portfolio is really important. Um, in the context of what we're gonna talk about in a few minutes, which is your coordination of the shelter beds, as well as the true need also for those longer term permanent supportive housing units. So again, looking at all angles and the differing needs of the populations you serve and trying to make sure we're matching the right resource uh, to the right person at the right time. And I think I'm gonna turn it over to Liz to actually chime in on that. Thanks, Doug. Um, so uh, one, uh, one housing model that does have a lot of evidence-based um, data behind it is permanent supportive housing. Um, and that is something that when we looked at your system, um, we know that there is a lot of good work being done, that there are the PSH providers that are out there um, in, in, in most circumstances are um, effectively providing PSH, but there is some improvements that can be made. And based off the number of uh, people experiencing homelessness who have disabilities uh, that are single adults, the amount of PSH right now that you have in your current system is not addressing the, the needs. So there's about 400 units um, of PSH dedicated towards single adults now um, in the system, and we're uh, recommending that you add 350 new PSH units um, through either new development or through uh, tenant-based or project-based subsidies. So it doesn't necessarily need to be newly constructed units. It could also be finding um, existing properties that are out there that don't have a subsidy attached, and you could add that um, for PSH, which is uh, long-term housing and services that are connected to that housing. Um, so in addition to the um, adding actual units, uh, we also um, have some recommendations around utilization. So if you look at your current utilization of PSH right now, the units are actually um, already targeted as PSH, there's an 87% utilization rate. So it's not fully utilized to its full capacity, which means not as many people are getting served um, than our resources currently available. So we have some specific recommendations around that. 
Uh, one is requiring that all uh, PSH referrals are conducted through the coordinated entry process. So right now, not all uh, PSH that is available is actually going through coordinated entry. So you really are not ensuring that the PSH that is out there is getting connected to the people that are most uh, vulnerable at that time. So it's really important that you try to get all of the PSH that you have and any new PSH created that it's going to be part of the coordinated entry system. Uh, additionally, it's important to ensure that uh, there are some proper training uh, and tenancy supports in place and that you have written standards around expectations among the PSH providers um, of how, uh, what kind of services they're offering um, and what the requirements are for them um, interacting with the coordinated entry system. So some of the things that we heard that sometimes there can be a lag time between when a unit maybe is available and the time that the coordinated entry actually learns of it. Um, and all of, you know, if you make those kind of expectations clear and require them, um, you'll see greater efficiencies in the utilization of the PSH. Um, also ensuring that there is uh, provider coordination with the system-wide landlord outreach and relationship strategy that we're recommending, which um, Doug will be talking about in a little bit, um, and really making sure that there's a focused effort on le leveraging reasonable accommodations. So another reason why we see um, gaps in fully utilized PSH is that a lot of times it takes uh, time from the time someone gets, for example, a tenant-based subsidy and being able to access an actual unit, um, all of that time spent looking and not actually having money being expended in that person placed in housing is reducing your full utilization. Um, and so if you have, if you ensure that there are those proper tenancy supports, both pre- and post-tenancy to ensure a move-in um, and leverage reasonable accommodations so that um, where, you know, you have landlords that are screening out individuals and it can be um, you know, related back to the person's disability, that providers understand that that really is a tool in the toolbox to get them into housing faster. Um, and the other um, area that we suggest too is uh, considering increasing the PHA standards. So, you know, one thing we heard over and over again that it's really hard to compete um, in the housing market here, that there really is, um, it's a tight rental market here, and if you have someone that has, um, you know, a perfect a record of housing and no criminal history um, and they have more money to spend and the payment standards lower than what the private uh, market households can uh, pay, then it's going to be harder to access housing units. So trying to be more competitive uh, by increasing the payment standard and you know some considerations there are that that might mean that you end up serving less households uh, because it's going to cost more but uh, I think when you look at the, in, uh, the current utilization rate of 87%, uh, part of that will go to the fact that it's not, the, the actual subsidy isn't being competitive enough. Um, so you're actually losing money by not, in a way, having a competitive payment standard. Uh, next up, uh, in addition to the PSH, this is really tied to PSH, it is um, beginning to uh, implement effective uh, move on strategies, and I think this is another area um, that is an emerging uh, field out there as far as trying to reorient uh, the homeless uh, system. Um, so I think what you'll see is there's a lot of people that are currently in PSH that have been there for many, many years. Uh, and when they first were able to access the PSH, uh, they were definitely probably in a place where uh, they needed that level of intensive case management and ongoing services. But over time, they've been able to stabilize. Um, and they may not uh, any longer need that those type of services that are associated with PSH, but they do um, have um, you know extremely low income, and their income is likely not to change. And they need that they really need the housing subsidy, uh, which other programs like you know mainstream programs as we call them, like the Housing Choice Voucher Program, are more geared to serve. So what's happening is people are remaining in PSH more for affordability reasons. Um, than the need for the actual service component. Um, and it's actually clogging up uh, movement through the system. So when we looked at your PSH turnover rate, right now it's at about 2%. Um, so what's happening is once people are getting in, they're never leaving. And that's not to say that there are going to be some folks that are always going to need PSH for the long term. But they're sort of, um, their situation's not going to change where they don't kind of need those services. But there are people that can move on. And so we're suggesting that you implement uh, these move-on strategies, which are really trying to secure um, other types of housing subsidies 
um, or actually units that are currently in your uh, portfolio. So that could be, for example, low-income housing tax credit finance units or uh, units funded through other uh, local um, uh, subsidies um, that you may have available and trying to get uh, either preferences or targeting for people that were previously um, housed in PSH to allow them to move on uh, to a uh, affordable unit, whether that's a subsidy with a subsidy or whether it's an actual unit um, project based um, that doesn't necessarily have those services, but it continues to meet the affordability. And once you move that household to a move on unit, as we're calling them, you then open up that PSH for someone that you know is you know unsheltered, highly vulnerable, that actually needs those services that are being provided. Um, and so, as part of that recommendation. Um, you know, we recommend that you kind of determine what kind of process you're going to use to identify those households that might be, um, you know, ready to tr transition um, from COC and other funded PSH units into move on units and ensure that you have a mechanism for tracking units and maintaining housing stability. Because the one thing you don't want to do is get owners, uh, whether that's Home for Good or other um, affordable housing developers in the community that are willing to. Um, uh, willing to commit to move on strategies to then have tenants that you know something might happen in their in their life or something uh, you know uh, goes awry and then they need maybe those service supports that you want to have some kind of way of uh, keeping in touch with them just to ensure that the housing stability is going okay. Okay, uh, so next up we just want to talk a little bit about um, the tenancy supports that are being provided as a system. Um, so one of the things that we did hear. Uh, throughout the different um, interviews that we had uh, were that in some areas, um, it not just providers, uh, but other community members felt like uh, the tenancy supports weren't always there to help people to maintain housing. And then when you look at the data, uh, there is some backup for that. So overall, uh, across the system, you know, HUD has these different system performance measures and they look to at returns to homelessness. Um, and within Lane County, uh, the last system performance measures that were reported when we were doing this uh, showed that there were 21% of people who exited to permanent housing from one of the different system interventions ended up returning to homelessness within two years. So that means all that effort that you made the two years previously, you know, someone ends up returning back to homelessness. And I think when you look at tenancy supports, this is really a key area of where, um, you know, uh, people um, you know, once they get housed, if they've been living on the streets for a long period of time, they not may uh, have necessarily, um, you know, the understanding of what it is to be a good tenant. Um, and, you know, things like, you know, keeping, maintaining, uh, you know, a clean house and paying the rent on time and not playing your music too loud and that they kind of need that case management, housing focused case management to ensure that um, those tenancy supports are there to maintain housing in the long term um, so that you're not putting out these resources to then two years later have someone being back on, on the streets in homelessness. Um, so we're suggesting that you ensure that you're fully utilizing those tenancy supports that are available, looking at providers to ensure they know how to provide for and build those uh, tenancy supports. Um, making sure that when you're looking at, uh, for example, applications for, uh, for PSH or other types of housing that have services, that you're ensuring that the right level of services are there, that a housing first approach is being incorporated, um, and that you have a uh, require system-wide training on that to ensure that you know the best practices in providing tenancy supports are happening as a system. You know, it's not really going to be helpful if you only have one provider out there that's doing a really good job, and then eight others, you know, are just doing okay. Um, so really trying to bring up the capacity, the system capacity in providing tenancy supports. Okay, um, and then the next area that um, is part of our recommendations is really focused on the coordinated entry system. And so, um, I think as Gina said, you know, one of the um, one of the strong areas that you guys have that is that you actually started doing your coordinated entry a lot earlier um, than some of the other communities. However, um, I think once we started really diving into sort of the current practices that you have, um, some of what you're doing might be based off more earlier recommendations around coordinated entry and that, um, that the coordinated entry has really evolved since that beginning uh, period of implementation. Um, and so uh, we have some specific recommendations around that. One is just that you're ensuring that all units that are dedicated to um, uh, housing homeless individuals, that they are part of the coordinated entry system so that you're really ensuring that people that have the highest 
vulnerability in that moment in time are getting um, the, the unit that becomes available. Um, we also um, are recommending that you add two county level um, full-time assessors with walk-in and phone capacity. Uh, so one thing we learned is that there really isn't uh, anywhere within the system can you just kind of walk in and get assessed um, and that that capacity should be there. Um, also have sort of phone capacity. Um, ensure that you have a strong housing navigation system with two to three uh, full-time navigators. So right now there is some navigation that's taking place, but I don't think it's uh, we don't think it's sized properly for the amount of people that you have that are unsheltered. Um, ensuring that you know once someone gets connected to the resource, that they can help them um, move through the system and get housed as quickly as possible. Uh, ensure that you are using a single. Uh, list for PSH and rapid rehousing. So the way it's structured now is there's sort of separate buckets for PSH and rapid rehousing depending on where you score. Um, so what that means, what effectively can end up happening is that folks that score PSH uh, but might be sort of lower on the list uh, for back, lack of a better way of uh, uh, describing it, um, they don't end, actually end up getting a serve because they score for PSH, but maybe a rapid rehousing unit's available. They're not on that list. And what uh, we're suggesting is to use um, more of a model of a dynamic prioritization, which um, HUD and USICH and other federal partners are really pushing out, looking at what are all the system, what are all the resources that are available in your system now, and who right now needs. Uh, that resource the most and making sure they're connected and that's not really based on well, who is scored for rapid rehousing. It really should be whatever uh, resource is available at that time um, that the person that is most vulnerable uh, gets connected to that resource first. Um, and then as part of that, um, also implementing a more phased approach uh, to assessment. So when we looked at, uh, instead of assessing everyone, uh, the full assessment right away, having more of a phased approach, when we looked at um, some of the folks that actually end up and entering shelter, a lot are only there, um, you know, for uh, less than a week, and then they're able um, to move out. Now we can't say if they're necessarily posit positively resolving their homeless crisis or not, um, but they may not necessarily be assessed if they're going to end up only staying in the shelter for a week or so. Um, also establishing case conferencing process among the navigators, the outreach staff, the coordinating entry staff and really ensuring that coordinate entry is part of this larger system and that you're connected to these other system-wide activities. So as you can tell, um, we're talking a lot about systems and one of the most important <coughs> partners in this work uh, are your housing partners and landlords. Sometimes landlord gets a bad name, so your housing partners. So we can't house people without places to house them, right? And what we see uh, in most communities across the country, frankly, is that the relationships that service providers have with their housing partners and landlords is piecemeal. You know landlord Joe or Jane Smith and you use their unit when you have somebody who presents in front of you. What we're suggesting is that we start to look at a system-wide landlord approach. And if anyone here has heard of a by-name list or your coordinated entry list where you uh, are recording information about folks who need services and you're helping to match services uh, to them based on those different attributes and needs. Similarly, you could have a by name landlord list where there's a centralized list of housing partners and willing landlords that will rent to folks that are coming out of homelessness. And some of those landlords may be more or less risk averse. Uh, some may allow for a couple of evictions in the past, some may not. Some may allow for pets, some may not. Uh, but having a centralized way in which to understand all of your housing partners and make sure they're being used by the coordinated entry system as a whole. So just because provider A had started a relationship with Jane Smith Landlord doesn't mean that only provider A can use Jane Smith Landlord's units uh, when, there's, when there's somebody presenting. That also uh, creates a risk for you providers in the room who have landlord friends uh, that uh, provider B is not going to live up to your standards in that relationship and then there's a, a bridge burn and that unit no longer is going to be available for the future. So one of the things that we've talked about in, in the report in here is if you're going to have a centralized management system for your landlords and housing partners is also to have some mutual accountability across your service providers to make sure those landlord relationships maintain their strength. So looking at a landlord handbook, this was done in a couple of communities where there's minimum standards of how quickly service provider A or B calls back Jane or John Smith when there's a problem, or when those rent payments happen, or how off, how frequently the landlord, uh, you check in with the landlord or housing partner to make sure things are going well. 
and they've come up with a, a minimum set of standards. And if the housing partners don't sign on to those standards, they don't access the centralized landlord pool, and are basically they're basically you know shamed into participating, right? So. Um, uh, looking at your landlord network, your housing partner network, whether subsidized, private market or not, looking at who has those relationships and having a way to manage those relationships and also to promote that through social media, through political will. A landlord that houses a family or a veteran or an individual who's been outside for a while should be praised on your Facebook or your county account so that they then see that their, their value is being, um, uh, is valued. And it also will promote other housing partners to maybe come forward with a unit or two and then maybe three or four as those standards are being met. So really looking at your landlord housing partner networks. We can't end homelessness, and that's, our, that's what we're all trying to do, without places for people to have homes. And, that, and the owners are the ones that we need to maintain those relationships with and supporting both the tenant and the landlord and making sure that we can keep that. Um, so we'll go on to the next one here. Um, so all this, uh, all these recommendations require training. Um, and this is true for every community. You have people in this room, and I'm sure in your organizations, that do wonderful work. But there's nothing uh, to be said uh, uh, more than having ongoing training and professional development for management, executive leadership, and frontline staff. Um, so we've outlined some specific training areas and even some free resources that as a county, as a city, you can come together and create some expectations around ongoing professional develops, um, development. So uh, you know, baseline topic issues around housing first and progressive assistance, uh, what, what does it mean to provide services in a client-centered, client-choice-driven environment? Um, looking at how your coordinate entry system is developed at the top level and making sure that everybody uh, throughout the system understands how to use that as input, including consumers. Um, looking at some of the free stuff, the COC program, HUD, there's webinars, the National Alliance on Homelessness. Um, I'm personally invested in the SSVF program that the VA does. They have some great trainings on rapid housing and, and diversion, things like that. And then also looking at some minimum standards for new staff. So a lot of turnover in this field. Somebody comes in as a new case manager. What is the minimum expectation for that person to engage in training material before they go out in the field so that we can make sure that we're holding our service package to the highest standard we can? Um, and then I think the final recommendation. Okay, great. And um, the last but not least recommendation is number 10. It's the um, creation of a new 75-bed low barrier shelter. Um, the report goes into much more depth about this, but we just wanted to um, make sure that um, um, the, the, you get the principle of it. It's low barrier, so it's for folks who are unsheltered currently that typically have um, lots of barriers to entering shelter. So therefore, they um, you look at them as the most vulnerable um, folks on the street, and then give it, creating that as a place um, for them to go to be safe um, at the night at, at night and during the day. Um, and then part of the um, the rest of the recommendations um, around the new low barrier shelter are really focused around the emerging practices that um, um, we've seen around what they call navigation centers. So we took a lot of those um, best practices that other communities have been um, doing over just the last couple of years. It, it's, it's not. It's, I think um, the one in San Francisco is in 2015, it was the first one. So it really is a true emerging practices, but there are principles of that that um, um, are working very well and lessons learned that we incorporated into our recommendations around the shelter. And there's just um, a matter of considerations around land and property use, um, location, the shelter is easily accessible, um, whether walking or um, or to a bus route. Um, you know, Eugene is not like a lot of the rest of Oregon. It's not very rural, so um, you um, have a lot of other services in there, and you'd want to make sure that the shelter was um, able um, to um, give folks access to the other services. Um, the shelter structure, layout, design, accessibility are outlined um, that all kind of weave into the cost as well as um, just your operations. So your principal having a, a vision and a mission of what the shelter is and who it serves and everybody who, um, making sure that everybody's on the same page around that, the population, the hours. And these are all best practices recommended through the, in the report um, based mo mostly on successful navigation model of operations. So, so what does this all add up to? I mean, the report is a lot more detailed. We're going to take questions, and I know we're a little over time here, but what is the impact? So if nothing changes in Lane County, homelessness will continue to arise, both unsheltered and sheltered. If you build a shelter and the other nine recommendations are ignored, homelessness will continue to rise in the county and the city. The shelter is an emergency response to folks that need an emergency need. It's just like an emergency room where, we, where we're helping the people with the highest vulnerability, the most need at this point in time. Um, but what we think is, if you look at these as a whole, the outreach, better utilization of your permanent housing resources, both temporary and long term, 
looking at diversion opportunities, looking at move-on strategies, getting creative with your landlord partnerships, while also building this back-end emergency need, then that can have a significant impact over the next number of few years on your overall homeless population, not just folks who are unsheltered, but actually being able to move the needle in Lane County and in, uh, in Eugene on, on the homelessness challenges that you face. So that's why we call this a package deal. The impact is, is, is predicated that, that these things are done in concert with uh, together and that, and that you're working on them simultaneously. Um, and for next steps, we have a couple of recommendations. I think the takeaway from this slide, because we are over time, is that we don't want to make perfect the enemy of the good. Right? There's a lot here, there's a lot of things to think about, a lot of work to do, a lot of people uh, to do that work. And uh, perfection is not going to be realized in the next day or week or month. But, but trying to continue to push forward on progress with actionable steps with people taking responsibility and mutual accountability for this work uh, will push you forward and just continuing to move forward. And I think the last slide, there's just an example that's in the report that we can provide that is just an action step template. It's a very simple thing. The best thing about templates is when they're mostly empty because it gives you room to grow and work. So I think that's it, and we'll turn it over here. Great, thank you very much. Um, a couple things I want to kind of remind everybody, this is an opportunity for the PHB and the HSC to ask questions. We're going to do that for about 30 minutes. At 12.30, we're going to take a break. Um, in the meantime, uh, members of the, of the audience, if you'd like to write down your questions, you give them to Alex in the back. At 12.45, they'll begin to answer, they'll answer questions from the community. But for right now, just the PHB and the HSC. So I'm going to turn that over to, uh, to everybody here. Uh, who's got anybody on the PHB here who's got a question? Okay. I'm actually on the PHB. Oh, you are? Oh gosh, well, come on up here. I'm sorry, okay. I didn't recognize you. Why are you doing that? Um, I would prefer to keep it in the PHB if we can, but if the staff wants to ask a question, I'm sorry. So do you have a question? Yes. Yes. Here you go. Introduce yourself. So, uh, my name is Tim Engel. I'm on the Colorado Home Sports Subcommittee of League, which is the lived experience advisory group for unhousing Asian. <laughs> um, you are recognized because we used to work when I was a part of SSVF. I thought I recognized it. Yeah, exactly. So, well, I, was um, trying to, I was trying to place it, yeah. Yes. Um, so my questions revolve around the TAC report. Is it possible to bring that up on the slide? Okay, uh, oh, that's so, okay, so on the appendix C, uh, page 27 of the report, um, I have a question about scenario three. And it's actually a two-part question regarding that particular slide. So um, on that page, there is a question about turnover for PSH, RH, and TS. And I was wondering if the turnover is <coughs> what we're using for a recidivism rate of people returning from PSH, RH, and transitional uh, TS into homelessness again, or whether or not that was turnover for the units themselves. So it's just the turnover <coughs> for the units themselves, and assuming, and that's why the tenancy supports is one of our key recommendations, it's assuming that those turnovers are exits to a positive housing situation, not returns to homelessness. So that is a really good question, and a key part of our recommendations of why um, you know, all of this needs to be done together because we're expecting that with those turnovers increasing that you're not moving people back into homelessness, that they're actually having um, a positive result to uh, other type of housing out there in the system. So um, as for scenario C then, when we have a point where we 12 months later have zero unsheltered individuals, is the recidivism rate included in that count? On the, on the actual appendix, it says 12 months. So. I think that was yeah, we made, a, we made an update to that. So it's over, it's, it's yeah, it's an over a three year okay, so time frame. Three year time frame, yeah. not the 12 months. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, I only had the one that was no, currently it's... available. So forgive me if I didn't actually have the updated version. It's okay. a very important question. We have the whole version. Cooper, yes, yes, thank you. So then, um, even if I don't have the current version, in that 36 months, is the newly homeless identified of 130 a month included in that? So, yes. So in other words, for a month, we're including the individuals who are currently unsheltered, going through the system, 
plus the 1560 identified as becoming unsheltered or newly homeless. So in three years, that would be close to 4,500 additional homeless groups. That and, and so, I mean, I think, and Doug, you can talk a little more about this if you want to. Um, so the, the modeling approach that, yes, that's right. Um, so the modeling, the modeling that we did, I mean, it was a pretty straightforward modeling exercise, um, and you know, we do this throughout some other communities, um, and, and we try to incorporate as many assumptions and factors that we can that we know exist, you know, as far as like national standards. Um, but you know, it's not a perfect tool. This is not a science, and so um, it's assuming that you're going to get to these uh, different utilization rates. Um, and with the inflow, there is an assumption that we put in that modeling that assumes that the inflow number will decrease over time as you're able to divert more and more people. There's a natural assumption that you won't forever throughout time be seeing 130 new people every month. Yeah. Just to be and to just piggyback on specifically, it does include the current the, the current as the most recent hit number of people who are literally homeless and then rolls in your inflow rate, which which some of whom are recidivating back into homelessness from a previous episode. Right. So it right. So it's that that is it, it, uh, accounting for both of those factors. Okay, yeah, Brian. One quick uh, uh, just factual question. Uh, you mentioned the two percent turnover rate on PSH is too low. So do you have a best practice of what a goal is that we should be shooting for on the turnover rate for PSH? So in our modeling, we, we say 5%. There's only so, I mean, there's only so much, um, you know, turnover they can expect. Even in the private market now, if you're looking at where the nationally the housing costs are just skyrocketing and, you know, many, many communities, you'll see that turnover of people actually moving is becoming, you know, less and less because they're just hanging on to the unit they have. Um, and so I think for what we were trying to model is like, well, if you even got to 5%, um, you know, that's still probably ensuring that the people that really need PSH can stay there, um, but that you can expect that that level of turnover can happen um, as far as moving people on to other uh, units. I just want to end just on a practice side of things. I think it's the hardest balance about that is making sure that when, when we are helping people move on to another opportunity, whether it's PSH to their own rental market or move on strategy, that it's client-centered and that it's based on their choices and needs. So what we don't want to suggest in any way is that we <coughs> arbitrarily push our, our sorry, turnover rate of PSH or any other project and make goals that are then going to be a disincentive for the provider to provide the right level of service for that client. So I think the 5% we have in the modeling, some projects may be higher or lower than that. Um, it was just sort of an exercise in the numbers, but what we want to make sure is that we're not forcing people to go back into dangerous or precariously housed situations just to free up a unit. I think we would all know that, but I think it's important to say. It just helps to know what kind of goal we're shooting for. The larger question here, I think, is going to, as we are uh, competing somewhat for scarce resources, and we're talking about adding at least 12 positions that I hear in this so FTE, as opposed to adding actual housing stock uh, you know, in, in terms of where the dollars come from. And so can you speak to that issue of the funding sources and the wisdom of putting the money into the people as opposed to just putting it into brick and mortar? I think it's both, right? So um, our study really looked at your system and your homelessness system, your crisis response system. So that's where we were able to put a dollar amount based on very general local um, nonprofit providers in Eugene now, what they're paying staff or um, a loaded rate of the FTE. So it was a lot easier um, and more precise for us to be able to um, associate the dollar amount with um, staff time, which is very necessary. You have, um, as part of the recommendation, is the 350 new or repurposed PSH units, whereas I think you could do a whole other study as to like how to do that. That wasn't really in the purview of us of, of this report, per se, but um, that's another added cost that is very much there that is going to have to be dealt with in the implementation of this. Can you, can you say more of the sources of possible funding? That I, I think there was a little bit of that. Yeah, 
So you have, um, you guys know your local and state resources um, much better. Um, I know that um, just recently OHCS has um, come up with, uh, they did a statewide planning committee and a work group and they've come up with um, recommendations. I'm not sure if they're super final yet, but there's recommendations around putting, investing more money um, through the, um, I believe it's through the CAP agencies for um, the, um, some more affordable housing development and services around homelessness. Um, you have HUD resources, you have resources in the homeless program, the continuum of care. The state gets emergency shelter grant funding for some staff, staff positions. I don't think currently you guys um, apply or receive any ESG money. Oh, you do. Okay, never mind. Scrap that. But um, yeah, it's not. It's not a lot. It's none of it's a lot. The continuum of care application. You um, every year in the last recent years, you've been able to apply for new projects. Um, you know that's around permanent supportive housing, um, which is leasing rental assistance, as well as um, rapid rehousing and um, coordinated entry funds. So there's that pot of money that you can apply for. The higher you score on that nationally competitive application with all the other COCs, the better chance you have for actually getting those funds. Um, there are um, other multifamily um, programs at HUD. There's the, the state of Oregon is the recipient of um, 811 Project Rental Assistance Fund, so even tapping into that is for extremely low income people with disabilities. Um, so it's just, there's no, there's, there's little pots out there, but I don't think um, there's tax credits for more development, but there's no putting incentives into the, quality, um, the QAP in order to um, target those tax credits. It's um, targeting and making preferences at your local PHA that would serve people who are homeless or chronically homeless, that maybe you'd open up some more of that, those vouchers, and that's also HUD funding. So I think there's little pots here and there, and it's a targeting thing as well. Yeah, I think there's some little pieces too that aren't the brick and mortar, nor are they the housing resource. We talked a little bit in the report about risk mitigation funds or diversion funds. So one of the most successful things we've seen in terms of um, in, in, uh, incentivizing landlords to come on board, uh, aside from sort of political will and things like that, are risk mitigation funds, which is basically a privately funded pot of money that says if you ex uh, have experienced some big challenge, uh, or you're going to be um, out of rent for a month or two because one of our clients, we're going to we're going to be able to come in and make sure you're financially whole. By and large, in the cities and communities that have had those funds, they're never touched. But they give the landlord peace of mind, and the, and the providers don't want to touch that money. They want to make sure that that money stays and that they continue to, to to use that as an incentive. So things like that, those tend to be privately funded in most communities that have them. Um, they're they're foundations that will put up. A, a, an account that will act in that way and will make that commitment. So I think aside from some of these big ticket items, some of the smaller ticket items do take some of those creative partnerships. Chris McAllister. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Um, okay. My name is Chris. I represent unhoused, formerly unhoused people on the uh, PHP. Um, thank you for doing this report. Um, I do have some questions and I found some stuff that maybe you can direct it, direct me to it in the study if it's here. If not, maybe we need to as a community keep it in consideration. Um, while I saw a lot of things for our community to organize better and, and allocate monies better, I didn't see much for government reforms. I didn't see any look at our existing capacity such as bathrooms, showering, things like that, or ways that uh, our system might be creating more homelessness or extending homelessness, such as illegal camping, uh, forced uh, toes, loss of uh, services due to uh, being picked up on a misdemeanor no-show for a ticket for simply having no place to be. Um, that's my main concern. Um, I didn't see any recommendations on how government can kind of change some of their outlook on how to engage homeless populations. And I didn't see it looking in the appendixes for um, data on illegal camping or ways that we might be furthering the problem. Also, I wanted to note that uh, well, I see dormitory house uh, uh, site up offered in the uh, suggestion for a shelter. Um, I do not see in the appendix at least many interviews with people who are in such a shelter to see if it works within our community. Um, I wanted to just point out that while I agree with the diversion money of uh, being at least 50K, I was curious about how you went at 50K, whereas we've just recently allocated monies for 13, 14, 20 housing projects at 500K for a lot fewer populations than 1,600 on shelter. Finally, I just wanted to say I, I like the appendix B. If you look at the bottom, the longest road is the one where most of our people are in our community. There are a few stops, there are a few options, and there's roundabouts on both sides. So uh, 
please, uh, while you're advising, uh, let me know if I've missed any of the government items or if there's any way that I could uh, further assist by helping you guys meet with some people who might be able to help show that. Thank you. So I think around the um, local decisions around your, um, the overarching picture of um, your government involvement, the fact that you have this council as well as the joint um, working group with the commissioners in the city of Eugene County at the, at the table and invested in this, I think that's where those decisions have to happen. This report was really focused on um, what the current system has and the resources that you can use from an outside lens and then the idea of what a new 75 bed low barrier shelter would be. So um, I think that's why this report did include that, because we aren't the people that are going to tell you how to do that locally. Um, I do think that our recommendations and what we did find in our analysis and the assessment of the system can help inform those decisions though, locally. And was there a diversion? Oh, uh, the $50,000 diversion fund. Um, that uh, was sort of an educated guess as to seeing what other communities have done of similar size. We know that um, typically, if somebody's presenting for services, many will not be able to divert. There is no social network or family reunification that's going to happen. Some can be, um, and typically it can take a very small amount of resources. Maybe you help fill mom's fridge for the you know for a month or something like that, or maybe they're getting connected uh, to uh, uh, another family member. So that was an educated guess based on emerging practice, um, and that's sort of how we came up. Thank you. Um, Mayor Venice. Thank you. I, I'm really uh, grateful for this report. And, you know, so I'm going to ask you something that may be a little bit unfair, a little bit outside of the purview, but I just want to put it out there, which is that you've given us 10 recommendations and said that this is a package. And the reality is that we, we're not going to do all 10 things at once. And so I just wonder if you have some insights in terms of sort of bang for the buck or when you're getting started, you know, what are the things we should sort of think about first, knowing that we will have an implementation and task force that works on this? So I think there's, you have current resources now, right, that are already going into this. So we're not saying that you, you, you may need additional staff, but you can already start um, training current staff that you have. And that's making sure that your diversion staff, your outreach staff, um, that are already there, that are already being funded, that you already have the appropriations or the um, funding for that, um, they're, they're already changing the way that they're doing things to make it more effective. Um, I, I just say, coordinated entry is the backbone yes. to the housing system. And all of this is connected to that. Um, and so coordinated entry is not about necessarily entry to shelter, it's about entry into the housing resources and services. So I think if you're really thinking about like, what is the work group that starts this work? And the coordinated entry and really thinking about the recommendations there. Um, because that informs then who your outreach teams are going to target because your coordinated entry system is looking for the folks who need the services now the most, right? And similarly, through coordinated entry, you can have a sense of where people are coming from and their situations if you do that phase assessment approach, which helps you inform your diversion training and figuring out kind of what that placement looks like, where those people are positioned. So I think as the backbone of your housing network, coordinated entry is is a starting point. I think the training piece is another one because it's honestly, it's free in many cases and it's easy to access and it can be governed by local managers and program directors to say, look, we're gonna devote uh, uh, two hours, you know, whatever it is, a couple hours a week or a month to working with our frontline staff to make sure that they have the tools that they need to, to become successful in their jobs, which is helping people not be homeless anymore. Um, so I, I would suggest that those are sort of your backbone issues, whereas these other pieces take longer and they take more money and they take building things, um, uh, those are the key pieces you can start with. And then just a follow-up question to that, I mean, part of what triggered the request for this for your work was our commitment to creating a shelter. And so I am interested also in your reflection because you've worked with other communities. I mean, we have a city-county partnership here. Ideally, we would have more city and others, I mean, Springfield, we might we would bring in other cities. You know, if you could reflect a little bit on how how that interaction between that you know we actually do different work in the city and the county, we take responsibility for different things. So, do you have any reflections there also on on that collaboration? So, through this process, through our process over the last nine ten months, we worked closely with the county as our our main contractor with the city as well, right? So we didn't see. A huge um, line. It was a, it was very much a coordination and a partnership. 
Um, so I know locally there's different roles that the county and the city plays. Um, I think we've been in other communities where um, they don't get along so well as, as well as you all um, because it is right you're competing for resources you kind of the county has kind of one hat and the city has another hat and sometimes they're um, in collaboration sometimes they're not we're here I just think that we saw we talked to our executive director not only about this how, how they do play, how you all play together um, really well um, I think the, the benefits of that is that you guys are all on the table, are all at the table, like I said at the beginning, rolling up your sleeves and um, trying to really solve this. It's not like one of the partners are absent. And that brings in a, um, a larger pool of money, right? Your county is your cap agency, which could go to the state and ask for more money. The city um, also has um, entitlement grants that the county is ineligible for. So I think it's um, better access to employing your resources and then deciding as a, as a especially a team in a way, of how you're going to reallocate any resources that need to be reallocated. I, and I'll, I'll just echo one comment around when we presented to the joint meeting last time, I, you know, we've all tried to do this work as well as we can. We work with a lot of different communities. I've never seen such a commitment from an elected body, two elected bodies uh, in one room uh, before. So I thought that was um, just really great. I mean, despite the challenges, there's this sort of overwhelming sense throughout the, the elected officials in the, city, in the city and the county, the county officials, um, um, and, and the community that this is a problem that you want to solve. Um, we talked about last time this idea of mapping, uh, you know, literally drawing a map on the board and figuring out what things, what's happening. I think, a, you know, as silly as it sounds, a similar process could happen between the city and county to say, okay, what are the deliverables we're trying to achieve? What is the timeline? And who has, who has the best position to play that deliverable? Aside from just funding, but in terms of the getting to the work done. And I think it's hard to say the city does this part, the county does this part without looking at the full breadth of the things that need to be done. So even looking at the, a simple action plan template, right, very simple stuff, but saying like here are the six things we want to achieve in the next six months, three months. Who is best positioned to get that done or is it two? And, and, and then frankly holding each other accountable to that in a, in a respectful way. Um, so it's hard to say you should do this or that, but I think there, there's a, 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 an immediate next step that can bring you there. Commissioner Farr. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, you know, I, I serve, I'm a, currently a county commissioner for, for six years. Prior to that, as a city councilor for 10 years, you've been city councilor, and I was also in the legislature. Now, what that means is, not that I know how to do things, but what I, the things I've seen that we haven't done that we should be doing, you know, I have a, maybe a broader perspective on that, and I think Ed, Ed has done a superb job of talking about that. Um, I'm going to look at Eric Jackson for a second. I told him the other day that, that I, I study John Locke a little bit. And then there's a, a Locke quote. It says, don't let the things that you don't have prevent you from using the things that you do have. And what you've outlined are things that we do have that we could be much better at. For instance, coordinated entry. I've always thought we're pretty good. But I'm hearing that we can get better. We can get significantly better by utilizing more dynamic, um, uh, newer uh, methods. And I'm, I'm looking at the people who are, are coordinated, coordinated entry folks right there. I'm thinking, man, I thought you guys were the best in the world. And they, 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 they're doing awesome. awesome. Don't, uh, <laughs> And maybe they are the best in the world. I'm not positive about that. But, um, um, you know, you said that we were early. Uh, but tonight, you'll, we, there are only two elected officials here right now. Tonight, you'll have 13 of them. And I'll, I'll kind of, I probably won't get a word in edgewise tonight, by the way. So I'll get, ask a question today that I would ask tonight. Um, you're, you, you mentioned, Liz, that uh, people are staying in public supported housing more for affordability and less for need. Um, because of the lack of affordable housing upstream. Um, and that goes along with the fact that you're hoping for a 5% uh, move through the rate from public, from public supporting housing, public, uh, excuse me, um, permanent supporting housing. Well, I think 5% can be modest, but we, also, but we have to look at that in terms of what do we have for people to move into. And we all know that um, other than a, a small, a few isolated pockets, we simply don't have places to move into. And that's going to be uh, really a thrust for the future. And when Chris asks how to reshape government, that's not his exact quote, he said that uh, um, government reforms is asking about. Well, the reforms that we have to have in government is how do we find that way to move through? Because much of the success that you're, you're giving us getting to zero, functional zero on homelessness, re relies on move through and it also relies on utilization rate. And tonight, those are the questions that I would talk about is our utilization rate and move through because they seem to be immediate, um, uh, immediate uh, large impacts that we can have if we can enhance those. 
So my question then is, have you thought much about how we as governments can um, most thoroughly address the ways to uh, find innovative new ways to add housing types, permanent supportive housing, but also permanent non-supportive housing, and also the steps along the way. Um, I'm, uh, I have uh, Todd Boyle sitting behind me right here. That's wonderful, bless his luck. Uh, wonderful ideas about how we can use land more efficiently. So I think that's a part of the larger discussion is how do we get to the move through, how do we get to the utilization rate, and how do we uh, find more places for people to live? Did I bury a question in there someplace? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think um, the question is, as far as um, you know, outlining ways for you guys to develop more housing, whether that's, you know, PSH or other types of just permanent affordable housing. You know, that, you know, unfortunately is kind of outside the scope of what we are able to do here. And we have, um, you know, PSH plans that we do at communities where that's all we're looking at and use the same amount of time as everything that we try to put in this uh, report. Um, but I think, uh, I, I feel like I read something recently where you guys have like a land use survey, it's another initiative that you're doing as part of your larger, maybe it was the city of Eugene plan, uh, that there is land available, it's just more of how you're going to be able to uh, develop it. So it's really looking at all those federal resources that are available that we did outline in the back of this appendix and seeing how you can get uh, more targeted uh, PSH, for example, through low income housing tax credits. We talked about the, Gina mentioned the 811 PRA program, which is a statewide resource. Um, which that is, uh, you know, a subsidy type that is connected uh, to either existing or new housing, um, and, and a lot of times have incentives through the uh, qualified allocation plan, which is, you know, basically what um, is the uh, the plan for low income housing tax credits. So I mean, there's other resources that are out there that you're going to really have to look at um, and see how you can get this housing developed. Because I think you're right, it, you know, in order to have a place to move on to, you need to have a place um, that exists that you really are, I think one of the things we outline here is that the reality is that the folks that are very high, highly vulnerable are competing uh, for the same resources across the community as other community members that may not have the same um, issues. Thank you. And another, very briefly, another part of that is you talk about landlord involvement and the outreach landlords. Uh, when, we, when we went through Operation 365 Housing uh, Homeless Veterans, uh, the former mayor of Eugene, Katie Pierce, and I literally reached out to every single landlord association in town and got them participating in certain ways. But you're talking about a more vigorous and more thorough um, discussion of that. I hope you talk more about that tonight. And you don't need to write now, but tonight, really drill it home. Sure. Thank you. All right. Uh, Dave or uh, Cheryl, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but do you guys have any questions you want to? You want to ask the team? If not, well, we're coming up on 12:30, which was going to be our great time. I want to thank all, thank you for being here, and I also want to thank you for the hard work that you put into this, and you really provided us with with uh, the backbone to move forward. So thank you. Uh, just a reminder to everyone, uh, we're going to take a 15-minute break. Uh, in the meantime, there are three by five cards in the back and pens. If you've got questions, write them out and hand them to Alex. Um, she's right back here. So um, we'll be back at 12.45, and then we'll begin that. We'll go until 2. So thank you all for being here. So thank you. Thank you. Q&A So feel free to have a seat. I have the questions in my hand in the order in which they were received. So I will respectfully uh, read them that way. First question. Uh, there will be cost savings from the implementation of these pro proposals. Health care costs will be reduced, enforcement and incarceration costs will be reduced, legal costs will be avoided, education costs for unhoused children will be reduced. Please speak to the magnitude of these savings versus the implementation costs. Uh, yes, so um, one thing that's not necessarily part of the report but is shown in other studies is that uh, uh, and uh, not ending homelessness is more expensive than ending it, okay? Um, particularly for folks that are high-end, what we say, high-end utilizers of emergency services. So your hospitals, the county jail system, um, detox facilities, uh, the education cost is one that I, I don't know if it's been looked into really specifically in any studies, but it's part of something like that. Um, it's hard to say off the top of our head how it translates to these numbers, but in Massachusetts, uh, uh, an organization that I used to work for has been doing an ongoing cost study for 
uh, the, the relative cost of permanent supportive housing um, uh, before and after for folks who are high-end utilizers, the folks that are using emergency rooms to stay warm or because they, uh, maybe they have diabetes and they have diabetic emergencies because they can't keep their medication safe, things like that. But we should, what they, what they're showing in Massachusetts, and they work with Medicaid and, and, and other systems of care to look at these costs, is that um, uh, they're saving per person they house in permanent supportive housing an average of ten to $14,000 per year per person. And that includes the cost of the housing subsidy uh, as well as the services. So for those folks who um, uh, really do have high-end needs, high-end medical fragility and things like that, um, housing them with supportive services, including the subsidy on the housing, is uh, less expensive um, than ending their homelessness. So I think anyone in this room would say ending homelessness is the right thing to do because we're humans and it's a humanitarian crisis, frankly. Uh, but for those who may not agree with that, I saw an agree sign, that was a cool sign. Um, uh, the fiscal considerations are as important and as compelling uh, for communities that have done this work. We also see when we talked about rapid rehousing, we know that it's a less expensive intervention than PSH. Uh, oftentimes you can um, use rapid rehousing for the right type of household that can be on their feet in three or six or nine or 12 months uh, without assistance. You're, you're entering their homelessness for two, three, four thousand uh, dollars as opposed to the cost of, of those folks um, to your municipal governments, to your police departments. Uh, maybe their kids can't get to school or are missing school or schools have to account for that. So we don't talk about specific comparisons here, um, but there are some studies out there we can you know, cite them, um, but they um, specifically talk about cost savings of ending homelessness versus not ending homelessness. And you'll, you would see that here too, uh, you know, in Eugene, in, in the city, and, and I think more broadly um, to your Medicaid system throughout the state. Thank you. Your report does not specifically recognize or address the problem in rampant methamphetamine use and addiction here in Lane County. Meth addiction is directly causative of theft, harassment, assault, largely against unhoused people who are unprotected. Do you see the need for a methamphetamine treatment and recovery center and outpatient wellness and sobriety support? Yeah, so um, I don't think we're going to pretend to be experts in the, in, uh, the correct or most appropriate model for uh, treating or addressing people with meth, thing, meth, 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 meth addiction, sorry, I'm not going to spell that word too much. Um, but we talked very specifically about your homeless crisis response system and the housing connections in the back end of it. We did not explore uh, in great detail your mental health system, crisis services like that, re uh, addiction recovery services. Uh, across the country, we can say that um, services for people who uh, have substance use disorders or, or, or have addiction issues is lacking, right? Every community in the country. So I don't know if I, uh, any of us are able to say you need an outpatient treatment center or what the best method is, but every community, including yours, uh, I'm sure, needs greater mental health uh, support systems and greater addiction recovery support systems. And part of this housing piece, we focus on the tenancy. So how do we make sure you don't become homeless? So for instance, if somebody, uh, and this isn't specific to meth, but somebody uh, is an active alcoholic, um, maybe we're not gonna solve their alcoholism or treatment issues in their housing, and maybe we will. We wanna make them not homeless, um, but these other recovery supports are necessary, and it's part of the tenancy support package we've talked about, but our report and our analysis didn't dig into your mental health system or your, or your recovery system enough to be able to say, you know, you need a new outpatient center. Um, I think that's probably a, a local discussion, but I think we can say with confidence that the more <laughs> the more services like that, the better everywhere right now, uh, particularly in the last, you know, five or six years. Um, no, and I just think when those conversations, like, I'm assuming they're happening, and when they happen more robustly, you have Trillet, you have your um, coordinated care organization at the table, and your other um, um, health service partners. One more thing, though. Uh, for the mental health services and addiction recovery support services that you do have, those should still be connected back to coordinated entry because those providers are meeting people who are experiencing housing instability or are homeless. So uh, I think um, for, uh, this is everywhere, it's easy to say this is our mental health system, this is our recovery system, this is our housing system. There should be uh, mental health uh, and recovery uh, service providers, whoever they are locally, as part of your, your overall community of partnerships that's working on this housing issue, because they have many of the same clients that we're talking about on the housing side. So there is a connection there, just in terms of that, that housing pathway. 
As a member of the Eugene Human Rights Work Group on Poverty and Homelessness, I want to thank you for a concise report. My question revolves around leadership and peer counseling integration. How will agencies create peer leadership, consumer leadership, and listen to the needs of the larger community to create public education and understanding? Uh, it's a great question. Um, so one thing we didn't dig into too much in this report, but I think we can say here, is that consumer or client, or however you want to find that word, involvement is critical. Uh, so as part of this, this implementation team, as part of this community-wide conversation, people who have lived experience uh, need to be part of that conversation. So there's a planning side of things where folks who are homeless or have been homeless in the past, they need to say, like, yeah, that, will act, that would have actually worked for me. Right, rather than uh, folks who don't have that experience, uh, assuming we know um, uh, what we're expressing. And we've done a lot of work on sort of consumer groups and things like that. On the peer piece, there's also, aside from this peer leadership, I think there's uh, a role for peers or people who have lived experience or who are homeless to play in the direct service level of things. So one thing that we're seeing when we talk about diversion and even outreach is that um, folks that have either been in programs or have been homeless before or not anymore being hired by service providers so that they have a natural connection to folks who may not want services or not, may not uh, trust the service providers who are coming in. Um, some of the better diversion, as I said, anyone who knows everything about diversion is lying, but some of the better diversion projects that are up and coming, they have a case manager who's a, you know, a trained homeless service provider sitting next to somebody who was previously homeless and having a conversation with someone presenting for services so that all of those ideas are represented. So I think consumer involvement is, is really important. Um, yeah, and then just to, to go back to the report, I mean, I think one of the things that we talk about is ensuring that these different um, these different system components, that there are expectations and written standards around providers. So uh, with peer, uh, the peer model, I mean, maybe that's something that is written into the standards for what the expectation is around either outreach um, or uh, permanent supportive housing, that you do have that peer model in there because we know that there are some real uh, value there. Um, and so I just think that's something definitely can be incorporated because you don't want just one provider doing that really well when um, it really can be, it's a system-wide uh, change. Um, when you came up with the projected salary for staff, um, was that linked to local cost of living and rent increases? Um, so I, yes, um, I, not rent increases, but more so um, the, the local service provider contracts that are specifically with um, the county right now is able to look at budgets and pull that out. So it's an estimate and then it's adjusted um, annually for the 36 months of uh, the COLA, the cost of living um, adjustment rate in 2019 at 2.8%. But so, I mean, you may end up paying folks a little more, you may end up paying folks a little less in that position, but that was the local numbers that we looked at. And this question came up at break, but just to be um, one add-on, that it's not based on cost of living in the sense that we didn't make a justification to say that those salaries are enough to live in, right, no. in Lane County or in Eugene. They were based on current contracts and that we just applied an assumption over time at 2 or 3% cost of living increases. So. Uh, if, if those, if this broke up right up, so to say, if those salaries are inadequate currently, that's just based on current contracts and not on estimates we provide. How can we correct less effective practices of existing providers? I mean, I think there's, I think there's a lot of different ways. One of the key things that we talked about as a main recommendation, one of the ten key recommendations, is training. Um, and providing that at the system level so that everyone is really at, um, you know, at the, uh, you know, across the board has the same understanding of the different principles um, that you're incorporating as part of, um, you know, your strategies to end homelessness. So that's one key area. Um, I think, you know, another area where I assume part of this happens is where uh, the COC evaluates um, how it's doing in a system and looks at projects at an individual level. Um, and if you're looking at that and you're seeing that uh, certain projects aren't performing and that they're uh, either not attending these trainings or not sure that they're grasping principles like housing first, um, and then maybe that becomes part of your uh, decision around you know, whether those are continuing to be funded. And, yeah, I want to just add to for non-COC or non-federal projects, we talked to you about this at the break a little bit, the idea of thinking about if there's county or city money performance-based contracting, so incentivizing better performance through the use of promising practices. And I'll just say, we don't have time 
to not end homelessness and not to do this work uh, nationally and, and what we do and what you're all doing. Um, so, you know, we knock on the door, we try to convince people, and then sometimes we have to break it down, right? And we have to say, if you're not going to uh, adopt these practices, if you're not going to play ball, if you're not going to be part of our solution, then, then, then our money, our limited resources need to go somewhere else. It takes a lot of political will, it takes a lot of personality will, uh, and sometimes there's contracting and, and things like that. But, um, you know, the, the ship has sailed on what works, uh, and providers that may not believe in what works, uh, frankly, um, may not be able to provide anymore because we need to make sure that we're using those finite resources appropriately. That's political. We need a navigation center with representatives from all access points, but can't have a navigation center if there's nowhere to navigate people, homes, and if shelter and policies aren't on board. How do we help people find homes? So I think um, each, ideally, each of those recommendations tie into that ultimate goal, right? The ultimate way to end homelessness is for people to have a permanent housing setting situation, apartment at home, a subsidy, how, however it looks. So I think each one of those recommendations, um, um, there's no magic wand, there's no one quick answer to it, um, just like there is to the funding resources. It's all layered on in your system and how your crisis response system ultimately gets people to uh, safe, permanent, stable housing. What's, what is the incentive uh, and process for moving on from permanent supportive housing? So um, I might hand it over to Liz, but the idea really is the permanent supportive, so it's that PSH, no PSH, yeah, PSH, permanent supportive housing, it's the support services and the tenancy supports that come um, with that affordable housing piece, right? So there's kind of two parts to it. It's services plus the affordability. When sometimes, and I, I don't know, like, uh, I'm not going to say statistically, but oftentimes I should say, um, a family or an individual who initially needed that intensive support services, that S part of that permanent supportive housing placement or subsidy, fixes, um, they don't need the support services that are there anymore, and that's like kind of the second part of the affordability. It's very expensive. You move on from that into just needing the affordability. It frees up somebody that may be newly homeless or newly <laughs> in the system that has really high needs. So you're putting them in that more expensive intervention, that PSH intervention, and then move in folks that would move on to a more just affordability-ish um, thing. So it's kind of the, the principle behind it. Right, and I think it's just important, I, I think we've already stated this, is that we're not trying to force people um, out of permanent supportive housing that need it. Um, it's not, we're not trying to incentivize someone that needs PSH to move on to move on unit. It's more, it, it should definitely be a client-centered approach. Um, I think similar to conversations around diversion, uh, a move on strategy would incorporate, um, you know, case management that is able to, um, you know, have an expertise in having these conversations and ensuring that um, it's uh, the client choice ultimately to move on. But, um, you know, I think for a lot of folks, they don't necessarily, you know, need or want the services that are associated at some point with PSH, but they do have that affordability need. Um, and that's where you know the move on units come into place, and that and that's sort of the incentive by itself. Just that they can still maintain uh, the housing subsidy portion, um, and they just don't need those services. And again, um, having some kind of uh, standards in place to ensure that there maybe are some check-ins here and there to make sure the housing um, the housing situation is working for them without those services. And, yeah. Just one other, there may be uh, two, two other pieces. One sort of some mechanical incentives. So if somebody is in a PSH unit that is tied to the unit, uh, they're in an SRO or a one bedroom, and um, their new affordable subsidy can move, and they can go to a different unit in a, in a, in a somewhere else they want to live. Maybe it allows them to reunify with family or their, their children. Uh, there's, I think there's just some of that dynamic too, where some projects can't accommodate the life goals of the people that, that are serving them just based on the physical structure of where they're living. I think there's an empowerment piece too, right? So um, permanent support housing is meant to be permanent in the sense that it's not time limited. Um, but some folks will always associate themselves as being homeless while they're in homeless types bed. 
homeless is not a human condition, it's a situation. And if we are able to give people an opportunity to improve their situation, I think a lot of people want to be able to do that if their income could support it. And there may be some people that go into PSH that eventually uh, or immediately are employed or working, are making enough living to be able to afford their own unit, and that gives them more choice in their own lives. So part of this too is people may not want to have to rely on that forever and want to have that ability to make different life choices of their own and have some of those freedoms that not every PSH uh, project can, can allow for just based on its setup and structure. Mm -hmm. This question is about shelter. Throughout your entire report, you refer to a single homeless person without acknowledgement of the very different needs of female-identified homeless women. You simply <coughs> mention mixed gender barriers for shelter. Given that women have been sexually assaulted or abused in mixed gender camps, what are the best practices in your shelter model that ensures that women are safe from rape, assault, and intimidation? Right, so of course um, safety is always um, the, the frontmost of any any kind of intervention created um, or developed, especially with shelter. And it's the idea, I think we, um, we've seen different models. One of the best practices is that it's, it is, um, it's partners and possessions and pets, right? So you're serving folks um, that are mixed gender in a shelter, but it's in a setting that's very safe. When we talk about um, shelter protocols and principles, it's really to talk about how that, that safety at the shelter is carried out, whether there's, um, you know, um, depending on what the shelter is going to look like, is it partitioned areas in, in the shelter, um, in a dormitory style, is it, is, is it, um, it, it, there's a bunch of different models, but it really has to be, um, it would be in the, the, the front and foremost um, um, discussion and policies and procedures of that very that low barrier shelter. It's very important. In the meantime, until there's a brick and mortar low barrier shelter, is there room for a soft wall shelter or a tent city? What are your thoughts on a tent city? <laughs> I mean, it is the image on your website. On our website. Our website. Oh. Oh, on the oh. report. <laughs> I mean, I think when we're talking, one of the things that we've talked about um, is we understand that, you know, there is this immediate need and that you have what is, I think, being called dawn to dawn now. Um, ten encampments, they're just, that's just a reality. I think that's just a visual of what exists right now. Um, but as far as uh, you know, we're, our report, you know, we're not focused on some of those other alternative methods that are out there. Um, our focus is really on moving the, the needle, and uh, we've said this before to the, the city and county staff, that ultimately um, sort of tent encampments um, and uh, some of these other projects, while uh, maybe, um, you know, trying to uh, make a, a, a place better than just being on the streets, it really, people are still unsheltered in those situations. Um, and so it's not going to be positively impacting any of your sort of system-wide performance measures um, to maintain um, unsheltered um, situations. Um, so that's just the, the reality, but you know, that wasn't really the focus of our report to look at other type of alternative shelter options. Yeah. Generally speaking, nobody wants to see a tent city. Um, but we, what we also don't want to see is the criminalization of folks that have no other way to stay safe and warm or warmer than they would be otherwise. Um, uh, it, that's the only alternative. So I don't think we could stand, stand up here and say tent cities are good. Um, I think we can say criminalizing them is bad. Um, and there's a balance between how much of the city or the county supports a tent city type space. Um, uh, versus um, making sure that there is active outreach and services being made available to people to try to get them moved on somewhere else. Tent cities are very sticky situations, I'm sure you all know. Um, but if you have folks who are uh, sleeping in tents or there's a community of people who are uh, in a tent city or a tent space, um, those may be your uh, primary outreach objectives for when you start to really think about who needs this service the most. Folks that may not be coming in, may be resistant to the services that you've offered, or the way I think about it, you haven't been able to figure out the best service for them yet. Um, so uh, I would just, yeah, I'll stop there. <laughs> are, are your numbers informed by demographics of people moving here from out of state? I mean, as far as the, we don't have, there wasn't data 
um, provided available to say where exactly people are coming from. Um, so we don't have the demographic figures on you know which uh, where people are coming from. We looked at as far as info. We really were looking at your system um, system wide data to see. Uh, who has been entering any of the services offered uh, that previously hadn't entered the system two years prior. So really just looking at who are the new people that have entered the system and that's how we came up with that inflow number. Right, and I would say we don't know if they were people that lived in Eugene all of their life um, and then they became homeless and then they became, they had to um, um, use resources in your system or if they were people that um, have never lived here and are just stopping over or have ties here and have come here for resources or have come here because they heard Eugene's a really great city, right? So we don't know that. And there's no, there's nowhere in any other community that I know of that, in general, that um, can, tell, can tell you, can, can tell through numbers and, and, and true data where folks are coming from into their system right now. And this got brought up a break too, so just for some added context, there was a comment um, that I had up here about the inflow of folks that are seniors coming into the state generally and that's not specifically to homelessness, which may have a couple of adverse effects. You may have a higher need uh, senior population that comes here and is unable to afford it. It's now part of the population of folks that you need to serve. Or you have folks who have moderately higher income who are pushing your rents up because they're retired in here. Right? So there's that piece. One thing I'll mention just on this idea of inflow or where do people come from more generally is there's no good data specific to the homeless population anywhere really about where people come from. We collect you know, last known zip code, often that's incorrect, misreported, so it's really hard to get to that. That diversion uh, recommendation we talked about, it, uh, this, in, the, in the sense that we talk about it, it's devoting um, a, a good amount of time uh, to having a, a, an in-depth, sort of thoughtful conversation with people who are presenting for services to get to really understand what their situation is and identify what pathway, what alternative to you being homeless tonight is there, even if it's temporary, so that we can try to work with you in a house setting, or maybe you'll get back on your feet because you have a friend or your mother, or maybe you did come from the county next door or across the state or across the country, and you've got mom or dad there that's willing to take you in. And so I think, aside from the, the raw data, that the practice of diversion gets at who are you, what can we do to not make you be homeless in this moment, and how can we support you moving forward. And I think over time you, you get to better understand from the homeless population who, who's sort of from here, who lives here, who may used to have been from here, uh, and those types of things. So the data sets are sticky, but I think some of the practices can get to that. You're talking about very high skill. That's right. That's, it's exactly right. So in, in the training recommendations in the report we talk about um, this this idea of diversion, of sitting down with somebody in crisis and looking for alternatives in the moment uh, requires specific types of training. Frankly, it requires specific types of personalities. I would be a very bad diversion specialist. I don't have the personality for it or the patience for it. That's not the role that I play in this world, apparently. Um, but there are really good people here and elsewhere that can immediately uh, create connections with people in crisis. Um, so maybe in your veteran space, your veteran diversion specialist is a veteran. Right, who has a shared experience in history. Maybe if you're talking about families and diversion, you do have people you know, who have been uh, in tough situations with their family, things like that. But it is a highly skilled mediation, conflict resolution type skill set that is not going to be necessarily for any sort of social worker that may be coming into the field. But trainable. Trainable. Trainable with a little bit of love and empathy as part of their personality. <laughs> and, pa and, pa and patience, yeah. yeah. Can you explain how these recommendations will impact the need for Egan Warming Center to continue operating? Will this help us to phase it out completely? So the Egan, so remind me what Egan, Egan is. Warming Center is our um, winter warming shelter that's activated when it's 30 degrees or below. Okay. With three days of marathon. Based on their protocol for activation. So, um, you know, um, So how do I say this? So I've never so a, a, a seasonal shelter or a warming center, right, where it's not open from a time to time. Um, those type of warming centers serve a purpose, and they're a very immediate need for a certain. Act. But I would never call them a best practice, or um, or there's best practices parts of it because they they inherently have issues around when are they open, how do folks know that they're open, 
Um, how do you, um, a lot of them are in church basements or in um, just sort of other um, places that aren't accessible to everybody that's being served. The, the immediate need is that night that there are no, and, and, and it's necessary when there are no overflow beds in your permanent shelter or in your other permanent shelters that are year round or even your seasonal shelters that you know are open every night. There's no way to accommodate people and that are coming to those doors. So when you have a warming center, I believe that's sort of, that's what it's for. It's making an unmet need for certain nights of the year but they're hard for all those other reasons um, around um, not knowing when they're open or how do you advertise what, what temperature it is, um, how do folks find out if it's open, does everybody come and line up, um, you know, um, do you have a permanent place for it? I think with Egan you guys actually have a permanent place opposed to, oh, it's church basement. So I, I, I don't know, I don't know about it, but it's, it's kind of that idea for it. It serves a purpose, but I would never, um, it would, um, it wouldn't be, it, it serves a purpose and, and it saves lives essentially in the really cold nights, but it's, it's hard to um, find out um, when it's open. Yeah, and so the modeling suggests that over time, the amount of shelter capacity you have here would be able to absorb the number of people who are homeless and therefore, hypothetically, in, in this sort of intellectual thought exercise, uh, you wouldn't have anybody who would need a warming center. In reality, we all know that people come in and out of, 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 of homelessness, that there are people who serve, who we have yet to figure out how to serve well, who are staying outside for prolonged periods of time, who we're trying to engage every day, every week, but may be resistant to those services that we offer, and that a warming center may be necessary on the coldest nights of the year when, when those folks decide it's just too dangerous. So, um, you know, it's hard to say what happens down the road, but they, they serve a purpose particularly for folks that, that frankly are gonna say no to you over and over again, but need that emergency response. It's a lot better and cheaper than, than having them end up in the emergency room, right? And that goes back to how we think about this as system. So, um, you know, yeah. What is the recommended FTE for modeling or planning each recommendation? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's part of the implementation plan. So we had, um, you know, again, you know, some of these, they're really great questions. Um, they're, you guys are right where you need to be as far as thinking of moving forward, but they really just weren't part of um, the studies that we did. So yeah, there are gonna be uh, probably some costs involved with actually getting this done and getting it implemented. Um, and that's what, <laughs> so part of a, you know, we have just like a, you know, basic template that we shared of like an action plan where you identify some specific action steps um, who would be sort of the lead person or agency involved in being responsible for those. And so, yeah, there might be some additional committed staff time that needs to be either repurposed or um, funding just to make sure that this all actually can happen. Um, so really good question, but that is not something that we looked at as part of the study. Since current government policies and practices contribute towards the inflow of 130 a month, um, and the number who struggle to move on from homelessness, uh, vehicle impoundments, unpaid citations, arrest warrants, how does Eugene begin to evaluate adverse impact and make appropriate policy changes? And not all these questions are answerable by Tabitha. The mayor's just staring at us. <laughs> I think we touched on it a little bit earlier, but it really is, um, I think, looking at the things you can change right now when you look at your crisis response system um, through these, the, the recommendations we've outlined and then um, eventually expanding that to local policies and there's some things that you can change and make effects of there's some things that you can't that just aren't good you're not going to be able to change for x y or z but i think it's knowing what you can change like even when you're attacking this, these recommendations or tackling these recommendations, it's kind of what are the lower hanging fruit or what can we do more easily? I would, I would suggest after, or maybe even through this process, you look at that in the, um, the broader, the broader, um, 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 the broader aspect of local ordinances, laws, um, tax coding, um, that sort of stuff, law enforcement, funding um, available. You have a, a very transparent um, county and city government when it comes around um, local policies and procedures that are being rolled out in regs, so I would just look at it in that like broader lens. I think it's, I think it's really hard. Yeah. Uh, will you please clarify if your coordinated entry recommendation includes 24-hour access and availability to community advocates' response? 
So I don't think we cost out having, uh, you know, I think that maybe the, like the phone line, that's something that you'd have to look at of whether or not that people are able to access the coordinated entry system 24-7. Um, so that wasn't uh, anything that specifically that we looked at as part of our recommendations. Um, and I think it's a lot of that is a big question of whether, um, you know, the feasibility there is of having access points that are actually open um, for them. I know in a lot of other communities what they do is they have a 24 access um, hotline that's open um, and at a certain point, um, you know, whenever, uh, you know, off the access centers close, they then have, um, you know, resources available either through the phone line or other marketing tools that let you know where um, emergency services are. Just that, that's an important clarification. Um, so I think there's a distinction between 24 access to the coordinated entry system in the sense of the, the assessment for housing on the back end and 24 access to emergency crisis services now. So certainly there should be, if, if somebody's encountered outside tonight, uh, you know, in the ideal world over time that needs help is unsafe is cold, that at any point in the day or night that, that person, we can get that person into a safe environment. That's a little bit different than at any point uh, being able to do sort of a longer term assessment discussion to figure out what their housing needs are. So um, part of our discussion was uh, the distinction between, in the report with the county city officials, the distinction between making sure that you have the emergency systems that are, can respond in real time, but then also thinking about what is the right timing for understanding people's longer term housing needs, knowing that some people could be diverted or may self-resolve in a short period of time. So certainly for crisis services, that 24 access is important. Um, uh, and then in terms of coordinated entry, which is really thinking about what's the long-term plan, that oftentimes you know, has a, a lag period where someone needs something tonight, but it may be a few days before the housing navigator or the case manager can meet with that person to really start discussions about um, where they're going. And that diversion piece happening kind of in the interim of that. In appendix something, uh, scenario three, where all the uh, recommendations are implemented, when does the 36 month timeline begin? Sorry, guys, <laughs> that would be when you start, right? <laughs> so if you start your implementation plan and it starts tomorrow, you would go, you would plan out 36 um, months from there. Um, but that's the template and that's uh, any template that you use, but that's just your long-term planning. Maybe you say we need three months or six months to plan, and then your 36 months go out from there. So it's kind of, it's, 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 it's what you guys think that um, you can do. Yeah, I mean, it's based on when you actually, I mean, again, I, I know we've already said this, but we're saying that this is really a, a package, that this is a system-wide sort of transformation, um, so that it's whenever you start um, implementing the various recommendations. So if you don't start implementing those until six months from now, uh, that 36-month period is going to start till then. Um, and, you know, and again, that 36-month period really is just something that we use an estimate of what is the potential of doing these different system-wide changes can impact your system. Um, you know, so, it, you know, there might actually end up being a little bit longer than that. Some recommendations you might be able to do sooner, um, but I think we're trying to give you a goalpost for what can actually be achieved if you're able to make all of these system-wide changes. Yeah. Don't, don't circle a, a month on your calendars and say we put at home almost 36 months from this day. I think it, it's going to be an evolving process. This is meant to be a, a, a demonstration of potential across the recommendations. Uh, within your recommendations, where do you see areas where people working on fundamental skills and capacities of people to exit and avoid homelessness? Where are people working on fundamental skills and capacities of people to exit and avoid homelessness? Can the questioner um, help us with clarify that question? So, the case One, management skills yeah. and the service skills? Well, I had a two part question actually. Like skills. There is always this focus right in the middle where all the money is, the power is, the control is, with the government and everything else. But bottom line isn't this while you're building your net the real answer? To go back even further, day one when we're a child, when we're in school, how come the school systems don't deal, tell you how to deal with depression, suicide, loneliness, um, all these issues that make a person broken and battered that fall through the net that become the larger majority of homelessness that you're not talking about. You're talking about that small portion of that wealth power of people that can re 
design themselves or refocus their energy and strengths and get guided back into the systems and get housed and stay housed. <clears throat> Bottom line though, the larger percentage of homelessness cannot, will not, and ever will not get fixed and be able to conform back into society until you first deal with the first step one. How come nobody ever talks about it? when you're a child? How come you cannot deal with these issues that cause all these abuses, battered situations and circumstances that break a mind down, a spirit down, a heart down, and emotions down to the point where you're so belittled into yourself, you have no place to stand and there's no foundation. <clears throat> so, yeah. Um, Life skills. Like the real yeah, I mean, so we, 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 did, we did not look at that. Um, and frankly, we're not um, experts in thinking uh, quite that far back. You know, but, I, but I appreciate your comment, because you're right, uh, that a lot of people have a whole host of life experiences that lead into homelessness. I do think, though, that there is a point to be made that uh, uh, if somebody has traumatic life experiences or has depression or doesn't have a, maybe perhaps the foundation, maybe the life skills to um, be able to navigate the system, right? Uh, that it's on us as the system or you as the system to, to, to be there to guide and that we're not predicating the housing on their ability or desire or anything to seek treatment or to be happy or to be sober or to deal with that. We're predicating their housing on the ability to sustain their tenancy and we're supporting them with their life goals to move forward. So it's sort of a, a runaround answer because it, it's a deeper concern. But what we don't want to do is say, you can come in and we're going to give you services, but first you got to sober up and go see your mental health counselor. The, the job that we have as systems and as projects is to meet people where they are with all those trauma life experiences having people who are trained in trauma-informed care who have connections to mental health systems if people desire to engage with those and to make uh, the, the services and housing we provide the, the, the choice and the pathway that the person experiencing homelessness desires, right, and helping to guide that. But we're trying to end homelessness uh, and, and in doing so, hopefully the foundation of housing can help folks that have those prior lived experiences to pursue life goals or not, but at least they're not homeless while they're experiencing them. Um, I, I don't know how much better I do. Yeah. And just the tenancy supports that we talk about, meeting, meeting the tenancy supports at where the person is, opposed to having a, a, a plan for tenancy supports without talking to the person. It, it's, enough, it's not a one-size-fits-all when, you, when we, or you talk about tenancy supports. How do you recommend creating truly affordable housing in the Eugene area involving all local people and not subsidizing any one developer? I mean, I, I mean, I, 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 am I right when I was saying this? Um, this is outside, you know, oh. development of, uh, you know, actual brick and mortar units. Um, it's kind of outside the scope of what our study is. Um, so we do have these recommendations for, um, you know, creating an additional 350 units. Um, those could be at, uh, actual new development, but it also could be tenant-based and project-based subsidies that go to existing units. There's different resources that are out there. There's federal resources, there's state level resources, there's local resources, and it's really about looking at all those different resources and seeing how you can start targeting those resources to the development um, of PSH or some of the other recommendations um, that we made. And usually that's through, uh, when you're actually awarding uh, funding, um, you know, it's usually through some kind of procurement process where you can ensure that, you know, the folks that you're giving the money to have the capacity to do um, what it is that you're trying to have them do. So that's not necessarily going to one provider and then it's based off sort of a fair and open uh, process. Yeah. Just, like, just to add, there's an affordable housing crisis in this country, right? Eugene and Lane County are not unique in that regard. Um, and I think there's also a distinction between affordability and sustainability in housing. So traditional affordable housing, we think of 30 to 40% of income. I bet most people in this room, including some of us up here, pay more than that to, to live where we live, right? So thinking about how we look at the sustainability of people's tenancies based on their incomes, uh, through formal sources or not, and whether they can continue to pay the rent that they need to, whether they're subsidized or not. Uh, but the, the idea that rents are rising everywhere in this country, in every one of our communities that we work in and live in, 
Um, and that is something that we're all battling and I don't think anyone has a real solution for. But being creative uh, with what we call affordable too is important to recognize that many people are going to be um, uh, uh, financially stressed paying their rent every month for the rest of their lives. And that's just the reality that people face right now uh, absent a larger national affordable housing conversation that we're certainly not positioned to have here. Do you know of any available grants and loans for individuals needing long-term permanent housing? I mean, there's, I mean, I just, you know, as I said earlier, there, usually there isn't, um, you know, there's obviously like some homeowner loans out there, um, you know, that are federal grants um, for sort of an ongoing subsidy the way um, you know, the way historically that works is it's money that's coming from either federal, state government, or local government to organizations who then um, are able to administer those resources at sort of the, uh, the more of the uh, level of on the ground to the consumer. So that's kind of how it operates now. And I don't know of any program out there beyond sort of home ownership type um, initiatives that the government has where you can apply directly uh, for um, a loan just to rent a, a house, but that's my understanding. All right, that's, so that's all the questions that are questions related to this report. Um, I thank you all for coming. There's This PowerPoint will be at lanecounty.org slash shelter study, as well as uh, the final report is there, all the, the system map, the graphics, those are all online. Um, and tonight, there's the joint meeting of the Lane County Commissioners and the Eugene City Council at 5.30 in Harris Hall. That will be live streamed, live cast on Metro TV, so you can attend in person, you can watch it on your computer live, or you can watch it later uh, at, at Metro TV. Thank you all for your time and for your participation. Are you